Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever the time you decided to watch this. Uh, welcome to this lesson on Cozy Apologia by Rita Dove. So Rita Dove was the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress. Now you don't need a technical education in American government, but essentially we're talking about being the poet of the United States for a while. She also happened to be the first African-American woman to hold that position, which being the first anything is quite a big deal. But when you consider the issues around race and race relations in the United States, that's particularly impressive, I think. Uh, this is just a quote about her, but I think it sums up who she was as a poet as well. So Dove concentrated on spreading the word about poetry and increasing public awareness of the benefits of literature. As the United States Poet, poet Laureate, for example, she brought together writers to explore the African diaspora through the eyes of its artists. So she, she used poetry as a platform. She talked more about poetry in general, and she talked about poetry in terms of the effect uh, in how it can be used to express the feelings of a community um, and the way African culture was brought over to the United States and the issues around there. So she's a very, very impressive woman. Bit of context around the poem. It is set during Hurricane Floyd. Um, just a bit of background. Hurricanes are, there's a list of what hurricanes are going to be named. That's decided by a separate entity but it's interesting and she talks about this the name of hurricane floyd at this moment it was an incredibly um devastating hurricane in september 1999 caused extreme flooding and devastation and death which i'm going to show you in a minute uh, and the poem is autobiographical it's her musing during the hurricane about her own life now most of you will be watching this while locked in or locked down however you're phrasing it into your own homes Hopefully you're getting out for your daily exercise, but it's quite interesting to think, what are you thinking about when you're not working, in your downtime, at the weekend, when you can't go out, like she couldn't, obviously during Hurricane Floyd, you can see the devastation in these images, what comes to mind for you? So this is interestingly quite a coincidental time to be teaching this poem. So the poem's title, actually I'm gonna go back one second. So yeah, Hurricane Floyd, $101 million in damage, and it killed four drownings, traffic accidents, and fallen trees. Now, that almost doesn't sound like a lot, but that's also a huge amount of devastation to people's homes, people's lives, their livelihoods. It takes years and years to get over something like that. So we're going to think about the title of the poem first, Cozy Apologia. I want you to take a second now, pause the video, make a note to yourself. What are the connotations of the word cozy? Because for me, it is about warmth, it's about being at home, being content, being snug. Generally, it also means that there's a cat involved. I don't think you can have a home without a cat. And colour and books, which you can, in my case, see behind me. Um, and an apologia is literally a text written in defence of something. So this poem is in defence of, well, I'm going to let us find that out. That is the question, what is she defending? And so as you listen to the first reading, and we continue on, I want you to decide what is she thinking about and what is she defending. So, cosy apologia for Fred. I could pick anything and think of you. This lamp, the wind still rain, the glossy blue my pen exudes, drying matte upon the page. I could choose any hero, any cause or age, and sure as shooting arrows to the heart, astride a dappled mare, Legs braced as far apart as standing in silver stirrups will allow, there you'll be, with furrowed brow and chain mail glinting to set me free, one eye smiling, the other firm upon the enemy. This post postmodern age is all business. Compact discs and faxes are do it now and take no risks event. Today a hurricane is nudging up the coast. Oddly male, big bud Floyd, who brings a host of daydreams, awkward reminiscences of teenage crushes on worthless boys, whose only talent was to kiss you senseless. They all had sissy names, Marcel, Percy, Dewey, were thin as licorice and as chewy, sweet with a dark and hollow centre. Floyd's cussing up a storm. You're bunkered in your eerie, I'm perched in mine. Twin desks, computers, hardwood floors. We're content, but fall short of the divine. Still it's embarrassing, this happiness. Who's satisfied simply with what's good for us? When has the ordinary ever been news? And yet, 
because nothing else will do to keep me from melancholy. Call it blues. I feel the stolen time with you. I think this is a fantastic poem. I think it's a really interesting rhythm, given that she is also sort of locked indoors and trapped. So really do keep that in mind. This sort of, you know, you're not being held prisoner, but we are all indoors in a way that we wouldn't normally necessarily be. Now, I, I imagine at this point in the lockdown, nobody wants to be either. So, it's for Fred. Who's Fred? Fred is her husband, okay? Fred is the man she loves, but it's immediately becoming personal. It immediately sort of identifies itself as a poem about love. And she's addressing him. It's second person. I'm thinking of you. It's intimate. We're being allowed into a story she's telling him there. But there's still this colour, this glossy blue. I love that image that she's turned a birobe. She's writing with a birobe. She's talking about the ink there. And obviously here we've also got a rhyme scheme and it's a perfect rhyme scheme. It's really, really accurate, these rhyming couplets. And it almost shows the perfection, the, the completeness of how she feels about her own life. My pen exudes drawing mat upon the page. I could choose any hero, any cause or age, and sure as shooting arrows to the heart, astride a dappled mare, legs braced as far apart as standing in silver stirrups will allow. There you'll be with furrowed brow and chainmail glinting to set me free, one eye smiling the other firm upon the enemy. So we've got some really traditional images of chivalry, of kind of very Disney, very old fashioned, arguably, images of masculinity and love. So you've got this idea of Cupid's arrow, shooting arrows to the heart, Cupid, a sort of god or sprite that would make young people fall in love by shooting arrows at them. Um, she can't control it, is what she's saying. That love is just there. And, and she's got no choice as whether she falls in love. And then you've got these images of the knight in shining armor. It's a semantic field, so it's a group of associated words or phrases. She, it's, it's accepting a light-hearted. She's sort of joking about it. You can sort of stand in the syrups, but not really. But actually, she's associating him to some extent with a traditional figure of being heroic, of this knight in shining armor. I mean, if you think Rapunzel, man saves her. Sleeping Beauty, man saves her. Snow White, man saves her. And they are generally princes on horses saving women. Now, that's not necessarily an image you want to take too far because, of course, it's a very outdated, very sexist way of seeing both men and women. But she's associating him with comfort, with joy, with contentment and with love as well. One eye smiling, the other firm upon the enemy. So she's seeing him as a protector, not necessarily in slaying dragons, but she feels safe with him. She's writing this during a dangerous, dangerous natural event in a hurricane. So she feels comfortable and safe with this man with her. This post-postmodern age is all business. We're on the second stanza now. Compact discs and faxes, a do it now and take no risks event. Today a hurricane is nudging up the coast. So brief moment for what I'm assuming is the young people watching this video. Compact disc is the long way of saying CDs, i.e. for playing music on or occasionally CD-ROMs for putting in your PC. OK, and a fax is um, a paper message but sent via telephone line. So it's kind of pre-email. Um, you would put it in a thing that looked like a printer at one end, type a phone number and it would appear at the other end. And that was kind of a moment in which business really started to speed up when things could be transported in small amounts of data or via the telephone lines. But it's a mundane world as well. Do it now. Take no risks. She's not excited by this post postmodern age, as she calls it. It's all business. It's all about these CDs and these faxes. And she's just like, well, what else have I got to do? There's no impulsiveness. There's no speed. There's no joy. But all of a sudden, a hurricane has come and it's disrupted everything. And it is oddly male. Big bad Floyd, who brings a host of daydreams, awkward reminiscences. So it's interesting here. Floyd becomes a little bit like a, it sounds like a bad mafia gangster in like a really cheesy movie. Big bad Floyd, you know, and you can imagine him in the little hat and the trench coat with a really terrible accent. It's a storybook villain. In contrast to her husband, who is the storybook hero on the horse, fighting the dragons, big bad Floyd is the bad guy. He's the cheesy bad guy, as much as her husband is the cheesy lover. 
and then you've got these daydreams. It, it's making her sort of reminisce. She's run out of things to do. I'm sure you're at this position. You've cleaned the fridge, you've tidied up, you've cleaned something else again. And now you're like, I don't know what to do. And so she's starting to daydream about her past. But this flashback that comes immediately with the hurricane is also a disruption of the rhyme scheme. We went from discs to risks, coast to host, and it's about to end. That perfect, comfortable, beautiful rhyme scheme is over. And that's because the hurricanes come. Teenage crushes on worthless boys, his only talent was to kiss you senseless. So she's now reflecting on her past relationships, which were shallow. They were empty. They weren't full of that love and that comfort and that security that she has with, uh, not with Floyd, with Fred. And it was, it was meaningless to some extent. There's this interesting bit of sibilance here. They all had sissy names, Marcel, Percy and Dewey. Then as licorice and as chewy. Now, you can interpret this in different ways. I wonder if the S sound is a little bit threatening, a bit snake-like. And it's part of this idea that the boys, teenage boys, and I mean no offence to any teenage boys watching, but that these boys maybe were a bit shallow. Questionable intentions. Maybe all they wanted to do was kiss. They didn't want a mor an emotional connection with her. This wasn't romance in that sense. And they are sweet with a dark and hollow centre. So they're pretty on the outside, empty on the inside. And that's what she's describing of these relationships. But she hasn't thought about them in a while. Now she's sitting inside waiting for the hurricane to pass. That's all she can think about. So it's sort of holding her back a little bit. Or it's pulling her back into the past. And making her think, wow, those were my relationships. And now she's got Fred. She's got this wonderful knight in shining armour. Floyd's cussing up a storm. You're bunkered in your eerie, so she's addressing Fred again now. I'm perched in mine, twin desks, computers, hardwood floors. So an eerie is a, a bird nest, high up, safe, it's secure, it's homely. Again, the place that they are together is safe, it's comfortable. He's bunkered, she's perched, they're happy where they are, they, they're together, they're comfortable, and they're safe. We're content, but fall short of the divine. So divine is another word for godlike or heavenly. And arguably she's frustrated here. She doesn't have an ideal relationship. She doesn't have a relationship made by the gods. She doesn't have the Disney relationship. She's not Sleeping Beauty or Snow White or Cinderella. She's just a person trapped in an office with her husband. But I think the fact that she says we're content means actually she's still quite happy. All the words she's used are about her comfort in this relationship. Whether or not she's happy that they're comfortable is another matter. Still, it's embarrassing, this happiness. Who's satisfied simply with what's good for us? When has the ordinary ever been news? So she's so happy it's embarrassing. So she may be content, but she's actually deliriously happy. She's just not singing about it, the terrible musical. And this rhetorical question, when has the ordinary ever been news? See, the argument here is there's two ways to interpret this. Does it feel inconsequential? Well, nobody wants to know about our relationship because it's normal. But I sort of think of it as there's a beauty in that. She doesn't have to shout about it. She can just go off and be happy and in love and enjoying her home and her safety, and her security and her husband. She doesn't need to make it news. She's not flashy. I'm sort of thinking about this in terms of celebrity relationships where you know everything, it's all over the papers. It doesn't matter. It makes no difference to us. And she's choosing to keep it to herself. Or at least it's not extraordinary enough for anybody else to care. So is it inconsequential? Is it just happy and special? And yet, because nothing else will do to keep me from melancholy, call it blues, I fill this stolen time with you. So... She's still with him. I'm filling this stolen time, this accidental time, um, just like the lockdown. This hurricane forces people to have more time, even if not more space in some ways, than they would normally have. Time you would be filling with shopping, going out, drinking, eating, sitting on the beach. All of that has gone to some extent. And it's the same for her. But she's choosing to spend it with him. His security is what she wants. The love that they have, the safety she feels. It's not a dream romance, but I would argue, and I think the person who made this PowerPoint, thank you to that member of staff, by the way, might see this differently. 
I see that as a comfort. I think she's choosing him because it's real, because it's comfortable and real in their home with the twin desks, the computers and the floors. No, they're not surrounded by gold leaf and four poster beds and palaces and second homes and and, and all the things that those kind of idealized romances have. But it's it's real. It's beautiful. They're content. It's embarrassing how happy they are. And she said that they're just two ordinary people who are lucky enough to be in love. So it's not a dream romance, but I think she's sort of pointing out there is no such thing. But what is beautiful is the ordinary, is the image of blue ink drying on the page or their little desks side by side and their lovely hardwood floors. The time's been stolen and she's chosen to spend it with him. Now, the alternative to that, of course, you could say is it's keeping her from melancholy. Is she using him a little bit? Is she taking it? Is it like, oh, God, well, I better I better spend time with Fred because I've got nobody else. I don't know. And I think it entirely depends on your own opinions and your own interpretation. And that is for you to make. So what we've got to look at now briefly is the rhyme scheme. As the storm comes in, it breaks down and it begins with these beautiful, perfect couplets. So I won't read the whole thing again, but. I will read the last word of each line. So you go from you to blue, page, age, heart, apart, allow, brow, free, and emit. Then we've got discs, risks, coast, host, and it ends. That's it. Reminiscences of boys who would kick you, kiss you senseless. Dewey, and then we sort of get a bit more back, Dewey and Chewy, but it's an awkward moment. Then we lose it again. Mine, well, there's sort of a bit there with divine. The point being, when this hurricane arrives, the oddly male Big Bad Floyd, the rhyme scheme gets disrupted. You can sort of find it again a little bit, but it's not there in that perfection, in that rhythm, in that contentment that we had before. And so that in itself has thrown her because it's brought her back to those awkward relationships, to those moments she'd really rather forget and kind of wishes she hadn't had those boyfriends before. So just a few more notes on the structure and the form. It is written in free verse, is the form of this poem. If you're doing a form audience purpose sort of analysis, or you're trying to make a point about form, it's in free verse. Okay, the rhyming couplet suggests initial contentment, but then it breaks down due to the disruption of the storm and the disruption of her thoughts. Her every day has been disrupted. And don't underestimate, I know I keep making this comparison, but you're all sitting in a room and your normal day and your normal lesson has been disrupted because you're not in a room writing this on a board, watching a teacher talk, ask questions. You're watching a video. We've been disrupted. And that's exactly what she's experiencing. It's the same basic thing. So it opens with this personal address. I could think anything and I could look at anything and think of you. And it ends with that. I feel this stolen time with you. So it all comes back to her love for him and her commitment to him. Just give you a second there. OK, so the key ideas that you want to take from this poem, uh, it, it's about hollow idealised love. So love on a white horse, Disney love, being saved, you know, w riding off into the sunset. Um, and it, that kind of image, love at first sight to a certain extent. Rewatch The Little Mermaid and tell me that's not strangely idealised, for example. Um, versus real love versus having a beautiful home with hardwood floors and your twin desks and your computers uh, with choosing to spend time together each day with enjoying the ordinary things. Nature is a catalyst for memory. That's a really important point. If it wasn't for this moment that the hurricane has given and of course the hurricane is a negative thing and it's forced out these slightly negative reminiscences, these negative daydreams. But the advantage is it reminds her how lucky she is to have the man she does. It's about the past and the present. It's about reflecting on who you were, who you are, and who you want to be. It's, again, there's this memory of failed love, these worthless boys, as she calls them. Uh, what was it? Sweet with a dark and hollow centre. It's quite a, quite a dark image, that really, for taking the mickey out of teenage relationships. And it's also about just the ordinary nature of contentment and happiness. It's OK to have nothing but your hardwood floors and your nice pen. And if that's what makes her happy, that's probably more likely to make you happy than having a man who slayed a dragon 
beating up a hunchback or oh no he's the hero but if you see what i mean then the idealized image of men who are expected to be strong and witty and incredibly attractive and able to ride a horse and all of those expectations no it's about having somebody real who makes you feel secure and you are secure in that place and i think that's what this poem is about just wanted to share this with you because this poem makes me think of the fact that we're all locked down and all the different things we're all thinking about now and the way Rita Dove has interpreted it. Um, and I found this quote from her and I think she's an incredibly impressive woman. So I'm going to leave you reminding you that there are no libraries open in the UK at the moment and we are all missing them dreadfully, in the, at least in the English department. She said this, the library is an arena of possibility opening both a window into the soul and a door onto the world. The library is an arena of possibility, opening both a window into the soul and a door onto the world. So what you're going to do is you're going to go back through this, you're going to make the notes that you've been given, and then when the lockdown ends, you're going to go to the library and read some more books, because that will save us all. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that. Thanks.